Once again to SoCo Chat, a podcast where we discuss all things concerning the County of Sonoma. This is where you'll have a chance to hear directly from leaders within our county government, listen to in-depth discussions about critical issues, and hear a variety of tidbits and tales about this wonderful place we call home. I'm your host, once again, Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County of Sonoma. In today's segment, we're going to talk with Andrew Smith, the county's agricultural commissioner and sealer of weights and measures. I want to know more about that sealer part. Yeah. Um, but before we do, we want to remind you about our weekly trivia question. Be the first to answer today's show, SoCo Chat question, and you'll receive, yes, one of our new limited edition SoCo Chat coffee mugs. At the end of today's segment, I'll let you know the trivia question for today, as well as how you can submit your answer. So please stay tuned. As I mentioned, our guest today is Agricultural Commissioner Andrew Smith. Andrew is a Sonoma County native and alumni of the Santa Rosa Junior College and Natural Resources Program. Uh, before going off to the University of British Columbia, where he received a Bachelor's of Science degree in agroecology within the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Uh, Andrew has 18 years of experience, well, about roughly 18 years of experience with Sonoma County's Department of Agricultural Weights and Measures, especially in the areas in, uh, of uh, pesticide regulation, pest management, crop reporting, cannabis, land use permitting, and industrial hemp policy development. That's a mouthful. Anyway, Andrew has a broad experience, and we're so well glad to have you. Welcome to SoCo Chat. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. This is exciting. Well, we we know we we have a lot to get into today, but um, first, let, why don't we start by why don't you give us an overview of what the Department of Agriculture Weights and Measures is, and can you briefly describe what it what your job is too? Yeah, I think it's best to start with the uh, Agricultural Commissioner system mm -hmm. in general. It's a <clears throat> it's a very storied uh, career. Uh, there's a lot of legacy in it, and it starts back in 1881 with a legislative act to promote and protect, and that was the establishment of the horticultural C commissioner system. Hmm. And you know that's a lot different than other uh, states. Um, California's system of ag commissioners is very unique in hmm. that every county has a department of agriculture and an agricultural commissioner and sealer of weights and measures. Um, and that that uh, establishment of the horticultural commissioner system predates the establishment of the State Department of Food and Agriculture, which didn't come around until 1919. Hmm. Um, when the state did form a Department of Food and Agriculture, their uh, mandates were to promote and protect agriculture, uh, develop the ag industry, uh, prevent pests, and ensure food safety, hmm. which were tenets of the 1881 Act to promote and protect um, and so when the Department of Food and Ag formed, they said, we can't lose this county-specific uh, regulatory authority over agriculture mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, promotion and protection of agriculture. So let's, let's envelop the horticultural commissioner system into uh, contracted work for the State Department of Food and Agriculture. And so that's where we, we get a lot of our, our programmatic work from is through, through CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulations, as well as USDA. And mm -hmm. then within the Department of Food and Agriculture, you have the Division of Measurement Standards, and mm -hmm. that's where we get a lot of our, our mandates for, for weights and measures work. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, obviously, the, uh, uh, the, the, the risks and threats to our agriculture, part, our agricultural industry uh, have, have changed a great deal since, since this, the, this all started. But, uh, uh, and, and, but that's part of your role, too, is to really help, help our agriculture industry overcome some of these challenges, correct? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we have a, a department mission to uh, promote and protect agriculture and ensure the the health and well-being of our, our community, the health and safety of our community environment and the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that through education primarily and then the enforcement of laws and regulations. So, yeah. you know, we have an overarching enforcement philosophy in our Department of Compliance through education. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we are regulatory officials. Uh, but re we really like to work with our uh, both industry and public stakeholders as well as our businesses to help uh, maintain equity in commerce and keep our environment and our community safe. Yeah. Well, I always appreciate our conversations. And I've told you this before, but I, you're a reminder that we are still an agricultural community. I mean, I think sometimes we forget that because we have such an urbanized population. But, you know, we have a, a large part of our economy is really uh, hinges on our agriculture community. And you guys are out there protecting that and help and supporting that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we do a lot of inspections. Um, we also do a lot of outreach and education. 
And uh, as far as uh, workflow automation, we're working right now with ISD to build out um, a, a portal on our website for inquiries, complaints, uh, surveys, and mm -hmm. feedback. So we can really get more um, community engagement mm -hmm. in our web presence and, and find direction and analytics in that that can help guide our our programmatic priorities and our service delivery in the future. And, you know, just um, as it relates to, you know, supporting the county and the, the community, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, our, our, our county, uh, the health of our county depends on a, on a, a varied and mm -hmm. uh, safe food supply. Mm -hmm. Food security is really key to, mm -hmm. to supporting our communities and, and protecting agriculture as part of that. Yeah. So. Well, help us to uh, get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Uh, tell, tell, what, what, tell us about how, your journey. How did you come to be the agriculture commissioner here in the county? Yeah, I uh, grew up in Santa Rosa, um, born at Community Hospital mm -hmm. uh, when it was Community Hospital. But, um, you know, went through the, the public school system here mm -hmm. in Santa Rosa and didn't know what I wanted to do in college. So I went to the Santa Rosa Junior College. Perfect. Great and, option. Yeah. Yeah. And I was working on my general education credits and I and in the uh, off time, I was working at a, a, a plant nursery around the corner from my, my parents' place, and uh, I didn't know what kind of electives to take, but I wanted to take transferable electives, mm -hmm. um, and I started taking ag classes. And then, you know, I, my first ag class, I was like, well, where has this been my whole life, you know? <laughs> did you come from an ag family? Or no, did you... no, no, no. Oh, interesting. Dad, dad's an engineer. Mom's uh -huh. a family nurse practitioner and okay. uh, worked in nursing education, and, uh, you know, they they – they wanted us to to follow our own path, and mm -hmm. and you found and yours. I found mine, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, it's been it's been really rewarding and fulfilling. I I took all the ag classes I could at the Santa Rosa Junior College, and then, um, you know, having dual citizenship, uh, University of British Columbia was an option, and they were at the time um, moving towards a more multidisciplinary agricultural sciences department and mm -hmm. offering. A bachelor's of science in agroecology and so i decided to transfer from the santa rosa junior college to ubc and i finished my degree there nice. and each summer when i came back to santa rosa um i worked as a pest detection trapper mm -hmm. an insect trapper for the county ag department that was your and, first job yeah and okay. realized oh wow you this know, is interesting this, this could be a cool career <laughs> and you know when i when i was graduating, um, it just so happened that the Department of Ag Weights and Measures had a full-time inspector position open. At the time, it was called a biologist, but um, they had a full-time inspector position open. I thought, you know, this will be an uh, exercise in interviewing. There's a lot more people out there with far greater and varied experience than I, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they hired me, and and the rest is history. I, I decided, um, you know, at first it was a job, and, you know, about five years in, you realize it's a career, mm -hmm. and it's really become a calling for me, and I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really feel very fortunate to to live and work here in Sonoma County and to have my dream job, as as the ag commissioner in Sierra Weights Measures. Well, it's certainly helpful to have somebody with deep roots in the community in your position, because uh, obviously your passion extends beyond just just the agriculture, but the whole community, and I, I see that with you. Now, most recently, one of the biggest challenges uh, for the county and your department in particular has been addressing the the local impacts of the avian flu outbreak. And um, this has really devastated our poultry industry. Uh, over the past two months, uh, avian influenza has hit, what, 10 commercial operators, 10 different sites, uh, resulting in the destruction of more than 1.2 million birds, including chickens, ducks, and turkeys, right? Can you can you give us an update of where we are with the outbreak? I mean, is it is it under control? How, where are we? Well, you know, I think our experiences with with COVID as a, as a community and a county, it's hard to say that anything's really under control. Right. Um, but, you know, I think the worst is behind us, okay. uh, primarily because there's been a lot of depopulation mm -hmm. um, of, of a lot of, a, a large percentage of our, our poultry inventory, if you look at the crop report. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's one of those things that, there's testing going all the time mm -hmm. with these poultry operators, and they really, um, you know, uh, the flock health is really the biggest, most important aspect of their uh, family business operations. And mm -hmm. so, you know, they focus a lot on that. And so when there's a presumptive positive test result, uh, CDFA then sends that test sample to the USDA. And mm -hmm. once it's confirmed positive, then the depopulation starts 
and there is established a quarantine or what they call a regulated area, which is a 10 kilometer radius mm -hmm. around uh, the location where it is it is um, confirmed positive. So, mm -hmm. you know, then then it's about notifying everybody in surrounding farms to, you know, protect their birds, practice extra careful biosecurity of which they are already uh, very fluent and practiced in yeah. um, to keep pathogens and and from being introduced to their farms but you know the time of the year um being a a, a very very important uh pacific flyway or migratory pathway for waterfowl moving from the aleutians and alaska and russia down through the coast the pacific coast into mexico it's hard for there not to be um interactions between or 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 um the potential for contamination right. from migratory birds yeah. and, and waterfowl. And, and what we've learned is that once, once there's a, a it's detected at a, at a, at a farm, you've got to get on it. You got to euthanize the whole flock, right? And, yeah. and you got to get on it fast uh, in order to keep it from spreading to other farms nearby farms. Well, not only does it spread very quickly, but it has the potential to mutate. Yeah. And um, you know, this, this is really something more for the, the veterinarians right. at, at Cal California Department of Food and Agriculture and USDA, but um, you know we don't want we don't want a pathogen like that to jump to other uh, species or 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 worse to to humans and and so you know while there is no public health and safety risk to humans at this point mm -hmm. in time, we don't want there to be yeah. and and you know while there exists. Um, a, a, a vaccine, it's in trial still, and yeah. it hasn't been adopted uh, widely by by the U.S. So, right. you know, uh, I feel confident that it will. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think one thing to recognize about our poultry industry is compared to other uh, counties and other states, it's relatively small. Mm -hmm. The per farm population of birds is relatively small compared to other places in the world. And so, um, you know, most of our farms in Sonoma County, regardless of whether you're an animal agriculture practitioner or you're a crop producer, are, are small to midsize as, as defined by the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, will the will the industry bounce back? I have no doubt. Mm -hmm. You know, agriculture is quite possibly the most heavily regulated and also the most resilient industry there is in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, look how long agriculture has been around. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. we certainly all you know, need we, it. And we need it, <laughs> right? And no, yeah. no farms, no food, no food security. Yeah. You know, the food's got to come from somewhere. And uh, I think uh, it, it's the case that shouldn't shouldn't most of it come from here if it can? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I'm, always, I'm amazed that I look at the numbers, how many eggs are produced in our you know, uh, in our, in our poultry belt or egg belt of the Sonoma County. And, yeah. You have and, to, you have to think, you know, an, a chicken lays an egg a day, yeah. um, with the exception of, of the molt every mm -hmm. year. So, um, you know, a, a chicken's laying approximately 300 eggs a year. Mm, wow. You know, so yeah, that's yeah. a lot of eggs You're right. and we eat a lot of eggs and they're really cheap. Um, and very nutritious source of, of protein. Oh. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me, uh, throughout this this avian flu outbreak, what has been the county's role in, in supporting farmers and or helping the state in this? Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to plant agriculture, we're really very heavily involved on the ground. When mm -hmm. it comes to agric uh, animal agriculture, where veterinarians and more specialized animal health specialists mm -hmm. are are needed, Mm -hmm. um, those programs are more heavily carried by the State Department of Food and Agriculture yeah. and the Animal Health and Food Safety Services branch at CDFA, mm -hmm. um, and specifically the Animal Health branch in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing they do is they let the Ag Commissioner know. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the first to know are the, are the property operators, right. the farmers, and they have a very good network of informing each other. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, and that's great. Mm -hmm. And then we're we're notified, and then we do whatever we can to support the state in mm -hmm. their activities. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for us to keep our our com our community and county leadership in, informed. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't like surprises. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important for us to uh, do whatever we can to um, meter the messaging because mm -hmm. we don't want to create. You know, we don't want to catastrophize the issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, we want to we want to create an opportunity to handle the the safety oriented activities that need to take place mm -hmm. 
and that that are that's part of protecting agriculture right and also and also public safety yeah you yeah. know so we play more of a coordinator role in yeah. these animal health issues yeah. um we've served as a place to support storage of personal protective equipment and mm-hmm. test kits for cdfa and usda and helping with the composting yep. and checking helping, trucks helping and connect like- uh our state agency partners with the with the right contacts locally yeah. whether it's public infrastructure you know, or transportation or comms, Yeah, yeah. you know, so it's, well, it's a coordinator role. Yeah. Well, and we know that the board uh, of supervisors did uh, declare a, a state of emergency with this outbreak, which is opening up the possibility of financial support for farmers and some of their employees and, and also the ancillary businesses that are, there's, there's a ripple effect, right? Sure. I mean, there are feed stores that depend on these farmers to, for, to, to sell their products. And then on the back end, there's, People that depend on the fertilizer from these poultry farms, and uh, there's a there's a widespread impact, right? Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because you know the impact goes a lot farther than just uh, the cost of raising the birds yeah. to the age they are. And I want to you know get to back to one of our responsibilities is assessing loss. Once there's a disaster declaration or an emergency declaration, it's the responsibility of the Department of Ag Weights and Measures of the Ag Commissioner's Office. Uh, to to assess the 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 loss mm-hmm. related to that, whether it's a flood or or a drought or in this case a, a, a pathogen, um, we do surveying of our agricultural industry to assess mm-hmm. losses and we prepare that report uh, to share with the um, Office of Emergency Services and the USDA Farm Services Agency so that they can open up safety net. Um, uh, funding mechanisms for those farmers so, and you know we're looking at an industry uh, poultry alone that's nearly 50 million dollars hmm. and that's just the production value we're not talking about you know uh, veterinary costs you know human resources and employment um, the distribution of those egg and poultry products to any number of, right. of retail outlets in the bay area and the state and beyond Mm-hmm. So th- there's definitely a ripple effect, and like you mentioned, the the feed stores, the feed mills that depend on these poultry producers to provide feed for them. Right. But it goes even beyond that. It goes right down to the retail level and the feed stores that sell baby chicks and baby ducks to the homeowners. Right. If they're within a regulated area, um, they could they could have restrictions on whether they can even sell right. or accept, um, you know hatchlings to sell to people. Yeah. Well, m- one last question on this and we'll move on to another, but do we, so we don't, do we know the overall or have a sense of what the overall economic impact or we, do we know when that report may be done? Um, you know, at this point it would be, um, like pulling a number out Just of the guess. air yeah. back of the napkin, but I think at least 50 million. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, if you look at initial assessments in it, we were thinking 20 million, but then it goes beyond that yeah. because when you start talking to, the indemnification payments that uh, are the first safety net for the losses related mm-hmm. to depopulating, those mm-hmm. cover the cost of raising the bird to the age that it was when it had to be euthanized. Right. Those don't cover the 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 hourly wages of the employees. Right. They don't cover, um, you know, and I think that's a real misconception because people think, oh, these people stand to get X number of millions of dollars. And it's like, yeah, well... That's just to get the birds yeah. to where they were when they got depopulated, not not the value of the eggs that that bird would have produced in its lifetime, not the value at retail of that of that poultry carcass that people are going to buy and take home and cook, you know. So yeah. there's yeah. a lot more that goes into it's, it. It's it's very complex. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Well, the other uh, one of the other things we want to talk about that that is a key part of what your department does is you issue a crop report every year. Yeah, yeah. and this is really uh, a summation an overview of what, what are the total impacts of the crops? And I, I, I find it very interesting. Could, could you give us a little bit about what the highlights are of our, our last report? Yeah, I think when you look at our crop report, we hover around $800 million in, in production value mm-hmm. overall mm-hmm. and uh, a huge percentage of that, you know, roughly 550 to $600 million is our, our wine grape industry. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you have a hundred to, 115 or so million dollars that is uh, related to livestock agriculture, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. milk and milk products and Mm -hmm. livestock products such as eggs, poultry and Mm -hmm. other, you know, there's a lot of other things involved in that Mm -hmm. than just uh, 
just the dairy products and the and the poultry. Yeah. But um, you know, when you look at that, we still have a lot of million dollar crops in our crop report. Uh, I think we listed 15 this past year. Yeah, I think there were yeah there were 16 yeah, yeah. that I listed here. Uh, starting with apples are still Gravenstein apples are still there. They're yeah. still 1.6 million dollars. I think people forget you know that we we have a broad spectrum of of products in our crop reports. Uh, hemp at, at 1.8 million, rye 2.3, sheep and lambs 4.5. That's amazing. Yeah, we we really do have a lot of diversity. I think mm -hmm. of the Sonoma County landscape as like a quilt an agrarian mosaic of mm -hmm. of you know natural lands as well as farmlands and then um, you know re residential hamlets and and our 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 municipal city centers it's it's really quite cool where we live and in the context of of agriculture uh you know we've seen a lot of crops come and go this the this county's uh historical agricultural foundation was built on cattle ranching by mm. the spaniards mm. um when they were here and and sheep ranching mm -hmm. and then um you know we've seen crops come and go hops prunes mm -hmm. Uh, wine grapes were here the whole time. Yeah, wine grapes were 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 planted in Sonoma County, but they really didn't receive um, the level of economic interest, the increases in acreage, and the dollar value until the Judgment of Paris in 1976, oh, yeah. where California uh, wines beat out uh, French wines. And suddenly, it was on yeah. the map. And, and yeah. what look, was the name of that movie? Bottle Shock. That was the big, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If if you look at if you look at historical crop reports, you'll see after 1976, that's when wine grape acreage really took off yeah. and production uh, really really skyrocketed. Yeah. Well, today, as you mentioned, it's it's nearly 550 million dollar. Yeah. So that obviously is the big uh, the, the the big one on our list, but. Um, the number two uh, biggest crop is is at milk at nearly seventy million, um, and then as we mentioned, livestock and poultry products at, at about forty. But um, you know, our, our our dairy industry has been struggling too at times. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think there's a lot of different things. Um, you know, a lot of variables at mm -hmm. play there the, in the, in the in the dairy industry mm -hmm. between Sonoma and Marin County. First, first of all, I think. When you compare Sonoma and Marin County, you have, when it comes to dairy agriculture, you need, really need to think about it as like one land mass um, mm -hmm. because the struggles that Marin and Sonoma County dairies have experienced are, are, are not unique to the North Coast. Mm -hmm. We have smaller herd sizes than some of the dairies in the valley um, on average. Um, you know, there used to be a California, a separate California milk marketing mm -hmm. scheme, and then then uh, California got enveloped into the federal milk marketing order, which is a really confusing thing <laughs> to explain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think when you look at market and economic forces, mm -hmm. um, plus the pandemic and uh, generational shifts in the workforce, I, I think those those three variables contribute most heavily to um, some of the declines of yeah, our dairies. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've lost had. a few dairies. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to say we lost a, uh, somewhere around 10 dairies yeah. between Sonoma and Marin County in the last five to six years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's, you know, that's troubling, but at the same time, um, you know, people's consumers have changed their demand. And yeah. Yeah. I think that what we produce here in Sonoma County are really high value, highly nutritious, sustainable, and, and humane mm -hmm. um, animal products. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I'll continue to to purchase and consume Sonoma County products to support we do that too. industry. We do too. Well, thank you. I actually one time I'd like to have a whole session just on dairy because I, I find that the regulation of dairy is so complex, and 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 I I feel for producers of of milk and dairy products in you our know, area. You, you mentioned it earlier when we were talking about. Um, you know, regulation mm -hmm. and, and agriculture and, and resiliency. And, um, you know, there's, all, there's no industry that's more heavily regulated than, than agriculture. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a lot of, you know, whether it's water or air or, you know, energy use, um, you know, methane production, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many regulations that, you know, pesticide use, et cetera, that ag is confronted with, yet they still find ways to, 
to demonstrate their resiliency. And they're really first adopters and innovators when it comes to energy savings and water saving practices. Um, and in the end, you know, they're price takers, agricultural practitioners. Um, they don't they don't direct the way the market's going to mm-hmm. price things. And mm-hmm. at the end, they, so they want to sell their commodities. Yeah. they got to take the price that's offered. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to sh- shift to the other part of your job, which is weights and measures. I think yeah. that's one that people really don't understand as well. Could you describe a little bit about what you what, what that side of your 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 job is? Yeah. Um, so, you know, weights and measures in general, um, you know, has been around as long as agricultural mm-hmm. uh, activity in the world has. They kind of evolve together. Um and in the United States, the federal government left it up to the states to d- decide how they wanted to regulate weights and measures. And California and a, a number of other states have very robust and well-developed uh, weights and measures laws and regulations. And so basically, we regulate um, any device, and, and a commercial device is any device that is used to arrive at a sale. Mm-hmm. So any uh, by, by weight, measure, count... Uh, you name it. Mm-hmm. And so those devices are under our authority to seal the accuracy of those devices too. And that's to that's to make sure equity prevails in the marketplace to protect both consumers and business owners alike. It's it's we we kind of are there to level the yeah. playing field yeah, make it in fair. commerce. So yeah. we're not talking just about scales, but we're talking also about uh, you know, gas stations, you know, making sure that they're 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 Putting out the listing, the right price, absolutely, and, and doing and all of those. Yeah, so, yeah. So you have employees who go out and check these, uh, calibrate, make sure they're calibrated correctly, and making sure they're yeah. Is, in fact, right- uh, our staff were featured on um, uh, on the the comms team mm-hmm. Instagram post. Mm-hmm. Um, it was Rudy, mm-hmm. uh, Rudy Ruelas from our department, and uh, you know all of our all of our weights and measures inspectors have a different district in the county and that district rotates every 3 years mm-hmm. and they go out to all the retail establishments and they test uh, commodities they verify the accuracy of the scales whether it's Costco or or Safeway or any any mm-hmm. retail food um you know outlet mm-hmm. as well as um you know the quickie marts yeah. produce stands um, and and then they all stations. and they also check receipts, make sure that people are being charged the right prices, right? Yeah, that's that's our price verification program. So they'll they'll go through and they'll they'll pick a number of items uh, at random, and then um, go up and and scan those all. And they should they should scan in the point of sale system at the price that was advertised because mm-hmm. the consumer by law is is um, has a right to the lowest advertised price, right? And so if, if there's if the price advertised is not honored at the point of sale, uh, then that, that constitutes a violation of business and professions code. And that's when we start once those those mount up, then then you're then you're looking at fines and, and yeah. violations for, um, you know, uh, overcharging the yeah. consumer. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing this up because last year we actually helped you put out a notification to the public that um the prices were really off it, during your check last year, year before, it was the previous twelve months. But um, and that in some cases, and there was on average, they you do, you found that there was a thirty six percent discrepancy for grocery stores and retail businesses in what and what you were finding in the receipts and what they were supposed to have been charged. And so we basically put out an alert to the public, say, hey, check your receipts. What, what, um, tell us about that. Is that is that pretty common that, that there's discrepancies I, like I that? I think when you are looking at retail that um, here and there an overcharge or or the computer not catching up with the the posted prices mm-hmm. or putting the sale items out too early, mm-hmm. you know those are just things that happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what happened during the pandemic and what we've seen coming out of the pandemic is that there's a lot of turnover. Yeah, a in lot retail. of staff turnover. Yeah, yeah, and and then and there's not as much coordination with. Uh, sales, especially online and advertisement sales, mm-hmm. and what's what prices are posted and what prices are computing at the point of sale mm-hmm. in these stores. So that's why I think we've seen in Sonoma County um, a huge increase in in overcharges. Mm-hmm. Um, it's primarily at retail, and uh, you know it's it's a it's a problem. Yeah. Um, 
you know, because if businesses are are issued an administrative civil penalty or a fine for for committing a certain number of overcharges regularly, well, does that just become a cost of doing business? Right. And and where does it end? Right. You know, and I think what 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 you see in situations where it becomes systemic is that's when counties talk because we communicate with all our other county partners. Mm -hmm. You see what's happening. And other counties say, are you seeing this from this place in your county? And and then we put together investigations. And those investigations go to the Consumer Protection uh, Division within the district attorney's office. And we have a great partnership with our district attorney and not only Environmental Crimes Division, but Consumer Protection Division as Mm -hmm. well. And I think, you know, the harm to the community is really to the people that are on the fixed income. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, those are historically underrepresented populations. Those are, um, you know, protected classes of people, mm-hmm. um, you know, and and I think it's 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 our duty. It's our obligation as Weights and Measures officials to to look out for everybody yeah. and not just for 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 the consumer, but also for the businesses, because you don't want. You don't want unfair business practices going right. on in your community because right. that, that really doesn't do anything good for anybody. Yeah. And you don't want the district attorney coming after you either. Right. And, uh, you know, one other thing I remember was it, it, that we, we saw a lot of price fluctuations. Price is changing a lot because of inflation. We're coming out of COVID. That was another reason we were, you know, that they weren't really always keeping up with what was the right price. It was not always an example of, you know, stores weren't always cheating people and often, you know, consumers would go back. I've, I've found discrepancies and stores are very good about, you know, get, setting it right. Yeah. But, but you do have a, um, th- there are times when you do need to pursue action against them. If there's these kinds of repeated, uh, cases of price discrepancies continue, right? Absolutely. Call us. Yeah. Yeah. Call us, reach out to us. 707-565-2371. Say it again. You know, 707-565-2371. That's our main office line. Yeah, that's good. You know? And the other, I mean, and the other, you know, message is check your receipts, right? Yeah. You know, don't, don't assume I, it's so easy for me to go through the checkout stand and just ring everything up and then I'll get home and my wife will look at it. Right. And she'll say, Hey, they, you know, they mischarged you on yeah. this. And yeah. So you I, know, awareness is really the biggest part of yeah. it. And, and being as aware as, as we can of, you know, our consumer uh, activity, I think is, is important. Yeah. Well, Andrew, we really appreciate you being here. I just want to ask you uh, something on the, on the personal side. Um, uh, where is your, uh, where is your go-to place in Sonoma County? If you have a, do you have an activity or a hobby or a place you like to go when you kind of need to unwind? Wow, no, I like the gym. Do you okay? That's good. Yeah, that's I like good. The that's, gym. A, that's a I good like place to sauna. unwind. What uh, gym do you go to? Uh, airport club. Okay. Yeah. That's a good place. Yeah. And um, you know, I like I like to be out on the golf course. I also okay. like to be out on on a trail somewhere. Um and I, I think there's I get the most rewarding uh feel of of, of sublime um uh, from yard work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I love landscaping and gardening and, and that kind of thing. Well, that's great. So, it seems to fit well with what yeah. you're, you're doing. So, yeah. well, Andrew, thank you so much, uh, for being with us as a thank you for being our guest today. We'd like to present you with one of our SoCo chat oh, coffee mugs. Be thank the you first so in much. your department to, oh, that's awesome. to have one of those, yeah, yeah. show your friends. Uh, and to our listeners, uh, we'd like, also like to give you a chance to win one of our SoCo chat coffee mugs as well. Um, be the first person to submit a correct answer to this week's trivia qu- contest, and we'll make sure you receive one. Um, our question again this week, um, it's well known that cartoonist Charles Sparky Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, was a beloved resident of our community for more than 40 years. Our question, every morning before starting work, Sparky visited a certain Sonoma County restaurant. What was the name of the restaurant and what was his usual order? If you know, email your answer to publicaffairs at sonoma-county.org. Once again, that's publicaffairs, one word, at sonoma-county.org. Be sure to include your your phone number so we can uh, let you know if you won. Also, if you have comments about this or any of other segments or have a suggestion for a topic for a future SoCo Chat discussion, please email us at that same address, Public Affairs at SonomaCounty.org. Thank you all, and we hope you continue to follow us on SoCo uh, follow us on SoCo Chat, which is available on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, and of course YouTube.
Thank you, Andrew. And, and for the rest of you, be sure to tune in for the next segment of SoCo Chat. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.